How's everybody doing? Oh, doing pretty good. Well, thank you. It's my, forget the, the make of this. I can't even pronounce the name, but it's um, and the, uh, <clears throat> the grandparents of the people who own this shop, they used to attend our church on the North Shore until they moved away, so. That's my one piece of clothing that's not hand-me-down or whatever you call it, or <laughs> used clothes or whatever. <laughs> no, that's not true. But I do have some clothes I, I wore when I was in seminary, so I so must be pretty durable clothes. So, um, All right. Well, we're talking about salvation, talking about soteriology. Uh, next couple of sessions uh, probably are more geared towards theological nerds. So if, if you fall asleep, that's all right. I won't be offended. Um, and if you, if you would be embarrassed if you fell asleep, then if you get up and go take a nap somewhere, that's all right, too. So, um, But I do think some of these things are important, and I just want to at least mention them. And for those who want to do some more study or follow-up, you're welcome to do that. Those of you who have questions and have more interest in it, uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, even if it's a little off the track, that's okay. Um, th these classes are more for your, your uh, um, chance to learn and not just for me to present information and data, which I could do all day, but may not be the best, so let's pray and we'll get started. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you as we just sang that your, your promises are always forever and they're yes and amen. Help us to remember that, Lord. Help us to live from a place of uh, security, a place of contentment, knowing that you are our shepherd and that we have everything that we need because of you. Lord, we confess to you that we often live our lives in scarcity. We often live our lives worrying about what's going to happen to us or our futures or if we have enough money or if we have enough whatever it is we feel like we're lacking. But help us to realize that in you we have all that we need. So thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for uh, just your presence in our life. And uh, guide us now as we study these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the first uh, uh, sheet I gave you is the meaning of the death of, of Jesus Christ. Some of this is going to be review. We did a, a sheet on the vocabulary of salvation. And so we went through some of these words, but I, I kind of want to look at uh, some of these specific things. To me, this, this um, page kind of summarizes uh, the aspects of salvation as they relate to uh, different things. You'll notice the main headings, uh, substitute for sinners, a redemption in relationship to sin, a reconciliation in relation to the world, and a propitiation in relationship to God. So the death of Jesus Christ is what we call a vicarious or substitutionary death. Jesus died in our place. He died for sinners. Uh, he did not die for his own sins because he had none. Um, obviously, he was arrested, and from the view of the religious leaders, they felt he had committed blasphemy, uh, calling himself equal to God. Uh, to the Roman authorities, uh, he was looked at as a rebel, as someone who was causing um, unrest in the nation of Israel. So you can see from their perspective, that's why they had to put him to death. But the theological, biblical perspective is that Christ came to suffer and to die as a substitute for us. And the whole Old Testament sacrificial system uh, kind of points to that. And that's why Jesus is considered the lamb. Remember when he came to John the Baptist, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So from the very beginning, uh, there's that idea. Even Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And so those who would like to either deny or downplay 
the substitutionary aspects of the death of Christ. And we're going to be looking at some of those today. Uh, to me, they, they, they skip over a lot of passages of Scripture. And, and although other ways of looking at the death of Christ, I think, have some value to them, uh, if you do not include uh, what's often called penal substitute atonement, PSA, um, I think you're missing out on what the Bible is saying. So uh, this is why I put the emphasis on the death of Jesus Christ being a substitute for sinners. So I already quoted uh, Mark 10, 45. That's where Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. 1 Timothy chapter 2, um, verses 5 through 6. And I couldn't find my regular Bible, so I had to get this. It's the student Bible, so I'm a student today. And I could hardly read this print. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Are you saying I need big print or something? No, no I just <laughs> No, I actually I could read this. I had uh, cataract surgery. I used to wear glasses and contacts and all that kind of stuff, but um, ever since I got cataract surgery, I don't need to. So that's what you have to look forward to when you get old. You get cataract surgery if you're wearing glasses now. And I, I started wearing glasses I think when I was seven years old. So. I was, I was so glad when I stopped wearing glasses. She's everyone stealing your stuff until she had cataracts. <laughs> yeah, that she realized. <laughs> she realized. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what happens with old people. We can't see it, so our houses get dirty. And actually, it's because we're really just lazy. We don't want to clean anymore. Um, anyway, getting back, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. It says, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in his proper time. So uh, another passage is John chapter 11, verses 50 through 51, uh, Romans 5, 6 through 8, 1 Peter 3, 18. There's many other passages, but those are the some good ones to go to to look at how Jesus died as a substitute for sinners. Okay, secondly, his death is a redemption in relationship to sin. I think when we talked about the vocabulary of salvation, when we talked about redemption, I gave the illustration of, uh, of redemption stamps, redeeming. To redeem something means you buy something. You buy it from a place of confinement, a place of slavery. What we don't have in Scripture is when you make a redemption, there's a price that you pay. So Scripture is not clear as to who that redemption price is made to. So that's been left up to theologians to try to determine what that is. Uh, some say that the redemption price was made to God the Father uh, to bail us out of the prison of sin. Others say the redemption price was given to Satan because Satan holds us under sin. Others think redemption is just, there, there's not a, a specific target as to who that redemption price is given to, but it's the idea that we're bought uh, from a place of bondage. So some scriptures to put down for that is 1 Peter chapter 1, 18, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, uh, Galatians 3, 13, and then we'll look up this one, Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 28. So Acts 20, 28 says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So Jesus paid the price. The price was, or the payment was his own death. Um, if you want to use the term, the blood of Jesus Christ, if you're raised in the church, you're familiar with that passage, or with that kind of language. Hopefully it doesn't bother you. But it wasn't until I... Um, 
he met some people who really were not brought up in the church and I didn't realize how much that phrase bothered some people. Like there was this one lady and, and um, when I was pastoring the church up in Hanalei, we had a, um, on Wednesdays, they, they dismissed school early and kids could go to an after school program at the church. And so we had like a little Bible study, uh, Bible club for these kids. And so she would send her, send her child there. Um, and then one day she was talking with me and she goes, yeah, I really like what you're doing here, but you think you could just not talk about the blood of blood so much? And I go, what do you mean talk about blood? And I'm thinking, we're not talking about blood. And she goes, you know, the, the, the blood of Jesus. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's hard for you to, to hear those terms, just think of the death of Jesus. Don't think of blood, you know. I, I think it's some of the songs that we sing, there's a fountain filled with blood. Everybody know that song? Uh, nothing but the blood or, you know, co I'm covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. How gross is that? But see, we're used to that kind of um, language. Um, and to us, that's a very precious thing. But, but remember that when it talks about the blood, it's talking about the death of Jesus Christ. Now, you could go into detail and say, well, blood had to be shed. And you could say, well, so that way Jesus couldn't have been hung. He had to shed his own blood. Well, that's only because there's the references to the Old Testament of, of the sacrificial system. And then, of course, the author of Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But again, you could translate that without death, there is no shedding, there is no redemption for sins, remission of sins. So uh, the price that was paid was the death of Jesus Christ. Um, People are the ones who are redeemed. We are redeemed from something. And most uh, scholar, biblical scholars, theologians will say that we are, we've been redeemed from the slave market of sin, is how they'll put it. We've been slaves to sin, and now we've been redeemed. So if you know anything about the history of slavery, uh, you know that often... Um, Slaves were, were obviously sold. Uh, and one of the stories that's often given, I don't even know if it's a true story that's given in a lot of illustrations and sermons, is the guy who bought the slave and then once the transaction was done said, okay, you're free now, you're no longer a slave. And that's, that's the image we have of, of how Jesus in his death and resurrection bought our price and delivered us from, from slavery. He sets us free uh, from being in slavery. Yeah, um, I believe at one time they may have been, but they can't now. They're set in their path now, so they can't be redeemed. Um, but I think even if they could be, could have been redeemed. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing that says it, was, it would have been through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not die for angels. In fact, it says that angels look, look at us and marvel at salvation. And the reason they marvel is because they can't experience that. They don't know what that really means. And then the other idea is that, you know, we're, we're, we're born into slavery. Angels were born good, and then it says that, through Satan, a third of the angel, host of angels fell. So, in, in a sense, they, it was their choice to go away from any type of salvation they may have had. So that's a little different than the picture we have of being in, in slavery, not being able to do anything about it, and then Jesus purchasing our salvation, our freedom. So, but that is, is a good question. Uh, you know, some people would like to believe that in the end, everyone will be saved, including Satan and all the demons. Well, there, there's no scripture for that. And, it, and to me, universalism, and, and there are a lot of different people who believe in universalism. Universalism is the idea that everyone ends up being saved. Um, there's some who actually call themselves evangelical. But they'll say, but I believe in the end everyone will be saved. There's different ways of looking at it. Some say that everyone who 
rejects Jesus Christ will be annihilated. In other words, they'll, they don't go on to live forever. So they wouldn't believe in an uh, eternal conscious torment in hell. They believe that hell is where you die, eternal death. So you actually die in hell. So that's how some people believe in universalism. Others believe that since Jesus died for the sins of all mankind, eventually all will be saved. They'll quote verses like Philippians, where it says that Jesus, after he gave up his um, attributes of deity to come to this earth and took on the form of a servant, even to the point of death, then it says that the Father raised him up, gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things under the heaven, and everything. So they'll, they'll quote a verse like that, say, see, everything will eventually be saved. That kind of universalism, to me, takes away from man's freedom to choose. See, universalism basically says if everyone is saved, that means certain people will be forced to be saved. And, and I just don't believe that's, uh, that's, that's how God operates. Plus, there's a lot of other verses that obviously don't talk about universalism. Okay, so people are redeemed from something, but they're also redeemed by something. We talked about that, the payment of the death of Christ. And people are redeemed to something. We're redeemed to a state of freedom, and then we are all we are called to renounce um, that freedom from slavery so that we might be servants to the Lord who has redeemed us. So we have an end goal to our salvation. Our salvation is not just so that we can have our sins forgiven and go to heaven, but we are saved for the glory of God. In other words, our salvation shows to the angels, so shows to the world that God is glorious, he's gracious, he's loving, but it also, our salvation is so that we can be called to his righteousness, to his kingdom, and to live for him. Now, many people, especially kids who grew up in Christian homes, uh, when they finally get to that age where they can understand the gospel, and if they're in a good church, they'll be shared the gospel. They'll be asked to accept Jesus. And usually when that happens, it's, it's, it's understood almost in what I consider um, self-centered terms. Oh, yeah, of course I'm going to believe in Jesus. I don't want to go to hell. And I'm feeling really bad about stuff that I do. And they're telling me that I, I can feel good once I trust in Jesus. See, so it's... There, there's, there is a self-centered aspect of, of our salvation, but the, the longer you're saved, the more you realize you're saved for a purpose. You're saved for God's glory. You're saved for uh, God to use you here on this earth uh, for his kingdom purposes. So we are saved from something. We are saved by something. We are uh, redeemed to something. Okay, any questions on redemption? The idea of redemption. Okay, third, uh, reconciliation in relation to the world. We talked a little about this. We looked at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where it talks about how in Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, or reconciling himself to the world. And then he says that we who believe in Jesus Christ are now ambassadors of that reconciliation to announce that reconciliation to others, to call people uh, to reconciliation. So reconciliation, as we talked about, means a change of relationship from hostility to harmony and peace between two uh, personalities, two people, two individuals or more. The need for our reconciliation is that our sin makes us enemies of God. Romans chapter 3 talks about this specifically, that no one uh, goes after God. No one really believes in him. We go our own way. We go after our own sin. And so that makes us enemies of God. Man is the main object of reconciliation. But in a sense, God is also affected by 
the death of Jesus Christ in terms of reconciliation. The need for reconciliation lies in God's enmity against sinful mankind. God took the initiative, reconciled the world to himself. This was done by the death of Jesus Christ, and that provision changed the world into a savable position before God. Yet though the world has been reconciled, man needs to be reconciled by changing his position about Christ. Then and only then is his condition before God changed. So that's why the gospel is called an announcement. We're announcing the salvation that God gives to mankind. We're announcing that God has reconciled himself to the world. And we're saying, be reconciled to God. Um, so, any other thoughts on reconciliation? It's pretty easy to understand that. We've had enough fights with our brothers and sisters or friends that, and then made up afterwards, so we know what reconciliation is all about. And then fourth, this is the one that, that gives some people trouble, only because the word itself is sometimes hard to pronounce, a propitiation in relationship to God. Propitiation means the turning away of wrath by an offering. In relation to salvation, propitiation means placating or satisfying the wrath of God by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. And so you can see how some people are offended by that. Oh, God isn't like that. That's the kind of God that the Greeks worshipped, pagan people worshipped. You had to bring a virgin sacrifice to the gods so that they would calm down. When the volcano goes off, you're supposed to offer a virgin uh, to placate, uh, you know, Pele, god of fire, uh, so that she will calm down and not destroy us. So that, that's why some people bristle at this whole idea. Um, but, but there are scriptures that talk about God accepting the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, Isaiah 53, which is a future reference of uh, referring to Jesus Christ and his death, uh, talks about how it, it pleased God the Father that he would die. And that, that may be hard for us to understand, but you have to, you have to, be, to me, you have to begin with God's love and realize that this is all done because of God's love for mankind. He did not want mankind to live separated from him. He did not want mankind to live in judgment. He did not want to be alienated from mankind. And so in order for that alienation to end, uh, it took the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. So a couple of passages for that is Romans 3, 25. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And then 1 John 4, 10. Did I give you verses for reconciliation? Romans 5, 1 through 11. And 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. I have a question. Yes. Well, that, that's a great, great thought, and, <clears throat> and later on we're going to be talking about uh, God's sovereignty in, in election and predestination and man's responsibility, and, and that's one of the things. Well, if, if, if this isn't how to look at what Scripture says, give me a better solution, see? And, you know, how dare we, creatures that God made, question what he's doing? But see, there, there are a lot of people, that's, 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 that's the sin of a lot of people, is questioning God. And, and we've done that at times, right? We go through something difficult, and even though there's a part of us that says, okay, God, I'm, I'm supposed to trust you, but right now I'm, I'm really having a hard time. Or you pray for something, and you're, you believe you're praying in faith, you're praying for a specific uh, response, specific answer, and it doesn't come about. Uh, emotionally, you know, it, it doesn't feel good. And if you, if you allow, in a sense, the, those kinds of feelings and those kinds of thoughts to keep going 
in the, in the wrong direction down a dark path, you can see how easy it is to start turning away from God. And in many ways, that's what sin is. It's, it's rejecting what God has said. It's rejecting God's plan. Now, of course, many people will say things like, well, I don't know, I, I can't accept the God of the Bible because look at what he said in the Old Testament, what, you know, to go in and kill all these people, kill even the women and the children, kill the cattle and the animals. What kind of God is that? Well, there, there's many different solutions that you can come up with that, okay? And, and we're not going to talk about that right now because we're not, we're not talking about theodicy. But, but the reality is many people get so caught up in that. And, and, you know, people who have rejected Christ or at least said they have, maybe they grew up in a Christian home, maybe even made a profession of faith at one time, but now they'll even say boldly, I, I reject Jesus, I do not believe in him, I do not even believe there's a God. If you, if you probe deep enough, you find there's, there's certain issues that may have occurred in that person's life that has caused them to go down that path. And often it's because of uh, suffering, pain, and hardship, whether it's their own, somebody close to them, or even generally what's going on in the world. And so they hear the phrase, God is love, but they don't see the God of Christianity acting in love. And probably even more than that is they see people who call themselves Christians and followers of Jesus Christ not showing love. And of course, we get defensive. We say things like, well, you know, love doesn't mean just letting people do whatever they want to do. Uh, you know, a parent who loves their child is going to discipline them. You know, you can go on and on about that, but that's not very satisfying <laughs> to the person who's going through those difficult times. So that's where you need to say, well, yeah, God is love, but he's also holy. He's righteous. So you don't, uh, to me, you don't, when, when somebody's struggling, in a sense, with the love of God, you don't just keep throwing into their face, oh, no, God is love. God is love. You can experience his love. I've experienced his love. You know, you can give all the testimony you want, but maybe the better thing to do is, okay, well, maybe, maybe the God you're looking at is not really the God of the Bible. Um, there's a guy who is an apologist, I forget his name right now, but he, he has this podcast and he always starts off by saying, um, um, you know, people will come up to you and say, well, I, I don't believe um, in the God of in, in, in God, and then, then you ask them, well, what, 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 what God don't you believe in? Yeah. And they, they start explaining it, then you say, well, I don't believe in that God either. Yeah. See, a lot of people, they have a misconception of God. And so that's why, in a sense, the more we know the Bible, the more we can be able to talk to people and, and in a sense, hopefully to open up their, their thinking and their mind as to the vastness of, of who God is. So, you know, just even though I said the whole plan of salvation to me has to start with the idea that God is love. Um, and, and obviously the love of God is very important. It still, it, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, negate these other aspects of, of God, his holiness and righteousness and things like that. All right, any other questions or thoughts on these uh, four areas? Like I said, it, this, it kind of sums up all of, you know, what salvation is kind of in what I consider not, you know, kind of a concise way of doing it. Okay, the next thing is this, uh, this chart I gave to you. So here's a question we can discuss. Um, average Joe Israelite who lived at the time of Moses, wandering through the wilderness... How was he saved? And was he saved differently than how we are saved as 21st century Christians? Or how about even the disciples when Jesus was on this earth? How were they saved? Did you? Okay. He believed that. But, and then, like, it says in the Old Testament, they were saved by faith in Christ. 
Okay. Okay, so it, get out your chart, and this, this is a way to go, look at something like this. So, the basis of salvation is always the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, and we've talked about this. So, so even for Joe Israelite living under Moses, his salvation was on the basis of the death of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously to him, the death of Jesus Christ hasn't even happened. And in his mind, do you think he's thinking, oh, you know, one day the Messiah is going to come and he's going to die on the cross. Do you think they really believe that? Probably not, okay? And that's why so many of them did not accept Jesus when he was here on this earth. And even though we could look back at the Old Testament and find certain scriptures that refer to the death of the Messiah, like Isaiah 53, there aren't too many of those that are very explicit. So chances are, even though Joe Israelite in the time of Moses, his salvation was based on the death of Jesus Christ, it wasn't necessarily something that was clear in his mind. Okay, the requirements for salvation, as was mentioned, is faith. It was, it's faith for the Old Testament believer, as well as faith for the New Testament believer. It was faith for the disciples. The object of faith is God. You have to have faith in God. You have to have faith in what God has said. So in, or, in a sense, your salvation is because you believe in what God has said to you. So for us, since we have completed scripture, we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament, we read scripture, we hear the voice of God, so that becomes the object of our faith. We believe in what God says has said. We, we read the word of God and we say, okay, I believe this. When you say you believe the word of God, you're actually saying, God, I believe you, if you believe that scripture is God's word. See, we don't, we don't worship the Bible. The Bible isn't on equal par with God. The Bible reveals God to us so that when we read the word of God, we accept the word of God, we're actually saying, I believe in you, God. Now, the content of faith, this is what differs from the Old Testament to the New Testament. For us, the content of faith is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because that's what we have. We have scripture for that. It's been revealed to us. It's been passed down through the ages. So for us to be saved... Remember what Paul said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And of course, he's referring to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul and his explanation in Romans is very clear that that's, that's what we believe in. That's what we have faith in. But can you see how the content of faith may differ a little to someone in the Old Testament? What might be his content of faith? Okay, so the object of his faith is God, like we've said. He's, the requirement of salvation is faith. We know it's on the basis of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, even though he may not totally understand that. So, but what is, so, so for, the, for the guy wandering in the wilderness under Moses, what do you think the content of faith, his faith included? How did they get their sins forgiven? Okay, why, well, you know, we, we forget the, the sacrificial system that they had. And, you know, we, we tend to think, oh, they brought a lamb to, the, to be killed, this tiny little lamb and this nice little ceremony. Well, you know, you got to think of those priests kind of like butchers. They spent all day killing animals. They, were, they had blood all over them. The altar was just, just, you know, dripping with blood. Why? Because there's many sinners. Exactly, because there's many sinners and people who want their sins forgiven. That's what they do. They would bring a sacrifice to the priest. The priest would offer that sacrifice and... 
he would say, he would put his hands on the animal, transferring the sin of that family or that person to the animal. The animal would be sacrificed, the sin would be taken away. What happened on the Day of Atonement? Okay, that was the sacrifice for the whole nation. This is for all the sins that the people had committed that they did not make their daily sacrifices for. Was it the goat? Well, there were two animals. There was one that they sacrificed, one that they let go into the wilderness. That's where we get the phrase scapegoat. Okay? Now, both those animals are reference to Jesus Christ. He is both our bloody sacrifice that died on the altar, but he's also our scapegoat because they would lay their, the priest would lay his hands on that goat, transfer the sins of the nation on that goat. He would release him into the wilderness. It was a symbol that their sins were taken away from the nation. And they could sense that there, it was the day of redemption. That's what that's, uh, the Jewish holiday is called Yom Kippur, the day of redemption. And that's their most holy day. And what's, what's interesting, of course, now there's, there's no sacrifice for, the, for Jews because there's no temple. You can't sacrifice if there's no temple. So you have certain Orthodox Jews wanting to bring the temple back so that they could bring back the sacrificial system. But you have a lot of other Jews who basically said, oh, that's over with, we've changed, things are different. It's all symbolic now. But they still have the idea of, of having your sins taken away, having your sins forgiven. That's still part of the Yom Kippur celebration. But so for the Israelite, Joe Israelite under Moses, the content of his faith was, I got to take this animal to the priest, and I believe that as the priest lays his hands on this animal and the animal is killed, my sins are forgiven. What did the author of Hebrews say? in relationship to all this. What's that? Okay, he went on to say that the blood of animals really does not save anybody. But that almost contradicts what you see in the Old Testament because it was very plain that when God gave the law to Moses, it says these animals take away the sins of the people. So well, what does he mean? Well, I think what the author of Hebrews is saying, because what he's contrasting is the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant had the animal sacrifices. The New Covenant had Jesus Christ. The Old Covenant, you had to sacrifice every day for your sins. Jesus was sacrificed once and for all for the sins of all of mankind. He says the blood of bulls and goats cannot really take away your sins because it was all symbolic whereas the blood of Jesus Christ can take away the sins of all of mankind. Why? Because he is God, and he made that sacrifice. But for the Israelite, the content of faith was connected to that sacrifice. Now, if he was a knowledgeable Jew, which many of them were, because they were taught these things, and, you know, he went to Anchor House Bible School in the wilderness, and he got taught by great teachers. Um, but, but the idea is that they realize, okay, this sacrifice represents something that is to come. And so I think for many of the Jews of the Old Testament, they knew that God was going to provide them with something final that would finally pay for all their sins. I think some did, yes. I think they, they, they looked forward, they had a hope of God's, in a sense, final um, situation. Even in the Old Testament, God would say at times, it's not the sacrifices I want from you. And he even said, you guys bring your sacrifices, but your hearts are far from me. Your yeah, so... And, and remember, in the Old Testament, it does talk in a couple of places about the new covenant. What does it say about the new covenant? The new covenant, God will take away the stony heart, referring to the heart of Israel, that even though they were God's people, they rejected him, they turned away from him. One day that stony heart would re, will be replaced by a heart of flesh, and they will, from their hearts, seek after God. 
That's what the new covenant does. So for those, so these might have been Jews more during the time of the captivity, during the time of Israel and Judah when they were just about to go into captivity. The prophets were prophesying a lot of things about the future. And so they were prophesying about the Messiah. So that's when they started getting the idea that God is going to send his Messiah, his servant, his anointed one, and that Messiah is going to bring salvation to us. Now, remember I said that word salvation can be used very broadly for a lot of different things. So each Jew probably thought of salvation in a different way. And so that, especially during the time of Jesus, even the disciples at times felt like the salvation that Jesus was bringing was salvation from the Roman Empire, salvation from human government, basically. So they became, all, so that they would all become libertarians. Okay, no, that's not true. Uh, but, but the idea that they would be delivered from the bondage they were in, they, the, the bondage they saw was that they were under the oppression of other nations. And so basically they saw the Messiah as coming to set up the kingdom of God, reestablish the kingdom of God, and that Israel would be able to serve God in the way they really wanted to. But of course, the kingdom that Jesus had is not just the kingdom of this world, it's a, king, a spiritual kingdom. And so it's the salvation that we have, it's a spiritual salvation we have. So you can see the content of faith may have been a little different for people in the Old Testament. Now, you could transfer this to, you probably heard the question, well, what about that person in the jungle, which is becoming really sparse now, that has never heard the gospel? What do you think the content of their faith is? Well, until they hear the gospel, it's, it's, only, it's only what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1. God has revealed himself in nature. So, you... you yeah, visions, dreams, in your conscious, things like that. So that's why we often hear stories of people in places where there is no church, there is no gospel. Somebody starts having this sense that there is a God. Maybe their traditional belief is that there are many gods, but they all of a sudden start thinking, wait a second, no, there's got to be one supreme God. So they start thinking that way. They start changing their behavior in certain ways, and they just start searching and seeking. God sends them a missionary. He sends them a Bible. Uh, well, they have a, a dream. Okay, so that, that's the thing. What about the person that, that dies before the missionary gets there? Well, that's why I believe that he's, he, his salvation may be there, but it will be on the content of the faith that God has revealed to him, the content of, of whatever it is that God has revealed to him. And it could be just there is one God, and that one God is powerful and is loving. Maybe simple, something as simple as that. Now, once the missionary gets there, once the word of God gets there, obviously there's a responsibility to respond to that word. And if there was a true salvation there, once that person hears the gospel, they're going to accept it. That's why in many places you hear stories of when missionaries got there, it was almost like a, a total revival at the beginning. Many people uh, were saved. This is what happened in Hawaii. I think, I think Chris Cook was here, and you may have taught, taught about this, how, how the uh, kahuna talked about that he had this dream that, that God was going to come in a box. And then, and then the explorers came, missionaries came, and they presented the, the king uh, with a Bible in a box. <laughs> See, And so they're, 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 it, it was amazing how many... Hawaiians put their faith in Christ, and now the church grew real fast. But a lot of that was, it was it, it's like God had already pre prepared them. And, and that's the thing to realize. When, when you understand that salvation is a work of God, 
And this is what, why we can be bold in our witness and our mission efforts. Not because every time you share the gospel, someone's going to get saved. But you know that God is in the process. And that you're, you're his servant, you're his messenger to bring that there. And that in a sense, it's not your responsibility to lead a person to Christ. It's your responsibility to share that witness and to call them to repentance. So, all right. So do you understand this? Does this help any as far as the difference in, in generations of how people were saved and then um, for people who don't have the gospel? Now, what's amazing is, as I said, they're, they're getting fewer and fewer natives out there who haven't heard the gospel because the Bible is being translated in almost every language now. And, of course, radio transmission goes out. Something, yeah. Yeah, it, it differs. And some of these languages, there's maybe a, a couple of dozen of people who talk it, speak it. Yeah. So, but what's happening is in certain places like Europe and now the United States, we've become so secularized that people are not hearing the gospel, even though it's right under their noses. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can run across people in the United States, never been to church in their life, have no basic understanding of the Bible. There's no biblical foundation because they don't teach the Bible anymore in schools. We don't have this foundation of, you know, biblical phrases or even phrases from Shakespeare that Shakespeare took from the Bible. We don't even have that anymore. We don't have those kinds of same foundations. And and so you're going to run across people that that are are about as pagan as that native in the jungle, or at least that the image that we had of the native in the jungle. In fact, sometimes the native in the jungle is probably more sophisticated than some of our modern pagans. Mm -hmm. So. Literally had that happen the other day. Yeah. Oh, did you? You're, you're a college student. Where is it? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, what religion is that? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and uh, what's, what's interesting, I don't know if you follow what's, what's going on with the uh, Anglican Church, Church of England. Uh, they just recently said that, that, their, that their pastors and their bishops can bless same-sex marriages. They cannot perform same-sex marriages, but they can bless them. Well, of course, there was a real uproar among conservatives. What's amazing, though, is... The largest groups of Church of England members are all in the third world, Africa, South America, uh, India, and they, they outnumber the Western liberal Church of England members by I think like five to one. And they're the ones that are rising up and saying, no, if, if this is it, we can't have, we can't have fellowship with you. But what's interesting is, you know, you liberal people tend to think that they're open-minded and stuff. But, and, and, you know, they're always the ones that are, well, we don't want to offend people. We don't want to offend people. But they're offending thousands of their own church brothers and sisters across the world. But they, you know, they want to push this kind of agenda. So um, that's why I say that the paganism... In, in, in modern countries may be worse than the paganism in a lot of these, what we think are third world countries. So, all right, sorry, went four minutes over. Thank you. So, all right, see you in about an hour.